Great. All right, let's go ahead and let's just highlight, let's go through uh, really quick Genesis, and then we're going to go on to Galatians. So um, Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Okay, we're only going to look at Genesis 12, 1 to 3, because we don't have time to go to, to, go to all of it. But just several things I want to highlight here. So here we have, we have, a, this is a command. So there's a, there's a command that, 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 that is given to Abraham, uh, go from your country. There's a, there's an object. He's to be going into the land that he's going to be shown by God. And so there's, that's an action, right? That, that, that's a command for an action. So that might also help when you're thinking about, you're thinking about what, what's, what's the action behind this or that precedes this. If we're, we're thinking about a command, what must, what must Abraham do in response to this command? Obey. Obey. Excellent. So thinking about the questions, uh, maybe that's getting at a little bit of the, the one question clarification that, that Jesus and Paul were asking about. Okay. And then look at, look at these other statements here. There's then several future statements. I will make, I will bless, I will make. And then there's this incredible blessing here. So these are all, number one, we can say these are all future. So all the tenses are, are future. And so the implication here is that these are, in fact, if we're looking at the idea of the full sentence, these are actually promises. So then maybe that helps get at, that helps get at what we're looking at as far as the promise of Abraham. Maybe that helps, okay? And then looking at these different things here, there, is, there are several different objects. So we have a great nation, right? Number one. I will bless you, two. I will make your name great, three. And then look at this. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So everyone sees from a broad framework of Abraham's calling and commissioning, there is, there is, a, there is this command, a call to obey. There are promises, right? And then in order for there to be obedience, what is necessarily undergirding this? What must Abraham do to support this obedience, right? What must Believe. undergird this? Believe. Okay, as on point, belief or faith. So a superficial reading will say, see, Abraham just, he has to obey and so this is a works-based blessing, okay? And what's missing is the, the, the belief that undergirds the action. And we're going to see that in Genesis 15, all right? So let's go on to Genesis chapter 15 now. And so after these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Fear not, Abraham, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. So again, here... There is this command. What is the what is the positive? So this is this is negative. What's the positive of fear not? Let's rewrite this positively. This command po positively. How can we say that positively? Have courage. Huh? Have courage. Okay. Have courage. What else? Yeah. So 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 be strong. But could we also not say uh, believe? And specifically, I'm thinking about trust, faith. Yeah, yeah, faith. But I'm thinking really, I'm thinking really this idea here of trust. Trust in me. Why? What is the what is the basis? What is the basis for this? The basis for this command is here. There's promises here that are going on here. I am your I am your shield. Your re your reward will be very great. Not worry, Abraham. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No, you could, yeah. You could also use the word worry. You could, you could, you could say here, this could also be worry here. Yeah. Excellent. But what I'm trying to get at is just because the text doesn't use the word trust or faith, it doesn't mean that it's not being implied strongly. Okay. And so many times throughout the old Testament, a superficial reading where we're not really understanding the sense that sense that's going on is that, is that, Oh, th this is works-based 
covenant. This is works-based salvation. But really what's undergirding all of these things is this idea of faith. And actually in Hebrews, that's what that's the whole argument in, in Hebrews chapter 11 and the, the hall of the hall of faith, right? Everything that was done, in fact, was done in faith. This is not a works-based salvation. This is, this is a, 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 a call to action in view of salvation, in view of God's relationship already given, okay? So moving down here, what is the primary promise in this passage? Or it, So this is part of the Abrahamic covenant. Righteousness. Okay, no, so there's... So there's there is excellent. So there's actually several here. So we can speak about the belief is credited for righteousness. So this is, we could talk about this being the gospel. We can also talk about uh, a right standing with God, right? But yeah, so excellent. So, but, but still, this is, this is, this is in response, right? This is this is a response to the promise. So what's the, what's the actual promise in this context? Offspring. What was, off, off, exactly, offspring. So there is heir. heir. Your very own son will be your heir. So notice here then, and then from this heir will come, a superficial reading is just to identify is just to identify this as Isaac, okay? But we recognize here that, in fact, this is pointing towards, towards the Christ, right? And so this, and this is a fundamental question to, to think about, okay? If we're talking about right, a right standing with God, if we're talking about belief, we're talking about uh, lots of offspring, what does this point back to? So this covenant, Abraham, this is, what does this, this points back to who? If you're talking about offspring and life and blessing, what was the first curse? I'm thinking big picture here, even beyond this text in, in broader Genesis. The first curse is death. Exactly. So we have Genesis 3. And especially 315. And this is the, the this is in view of the curse of death. Right. And so God's covenant with Abraham is being seen as a fulfillment of the proto evangelium. Everyone tracking there with me? And so we, we especially see this in, in Genesis 12, 1 to 3. In at Abraham, all the families will be blessed of the earth, whereas in Genesis 3, the curse goes throughout. Now through Abraham, the blessing will go throughout, okay? Is everyone, does everyone see that? All right. And so if we're talking about the, the undoing of, of, of the curse of death, we're getting back to uh, eternal type things okay so even though even though abraham's given physical land even though abraham's given physical seed even though abraham's given a promise of a name that's great all of these things are pointing to the eternal does everyone does everyone see that and 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 the idea here especially is because because if it's if it's only dealing with physical then why is there a need why is there a need for this right standing, this righteousness before the Lord. Whereas Adam, Adam and Eve had to leave because they have guilt, they have the curse, they have condemned. God's, God's reestablishing relationships. And of course, this doesn't deny that it wasn't existing before in Abel and Seth. Absolutely. But the clarity is coming before us that 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 through belief. Righteousness, a right standing, a, a, a state of righteousness is being given to Abraham so that he can be in the presence of God. And, but it's very in, 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 in fundamental form, okay? 
There's much more that we can discuss here in 1722, but we just don't have the time. At least you can see the type of connections that we're making here and what we're looking at here with the Abrahamic covenant. Okay. So let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and let's go into the text for tonight, the study for tonight. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to highlight for us, I'm going to write these down, just the main blessings of, of Abraham. I'll list some of them out here for us. And, and actually this would be an opportunity for you guys to share right now. So let's just go over here as far as a, this is the OT context. Okay, so context of Genesis, and we have right here. Um, so we're looking at the Abrahamic, Abrahamic promises. What are they? Let's list them out. Anyone give give some to me? Let's list them out before we get in the text. So, so what do you have for me tonight? Genesis twelve two, Pastor Kim. Okay, go ahead. So make a great nation, uh, bless Abraham, and make his name great. So we have blessing, we have uh, a great nation, and we have a great name. Excellent. So what's another word for nation? Ethnic group. Okay, that's true. Yeah, that's that's true. I'm thinking more everything country. that... Okay, yeah, so we could say country. Yeah, I'm thinking beyond just the people, um, Danny. What's another, what's another, we don't really speak of it now. There's some, there's some like that in the world, spring. but not so much. What was that? Of spring, of spring. Generation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, but, but, but again, that's again. So, so, so nation, Community. human race or parallel term to country, right? A country. What's another word for, it's all over scripture, right? The, the, what of Israel kingdom. Kingdom. Oh. <laughs> that kind of gets a little bit more what's going on You're like wow <laughs> right yeah, that we can we can we can begin to really understand the significance of i'm going to make a great nation of you it's so much more than a people it's land it's government it's power it's wealth resources right and so and and we can we can really relate to this we can really relate to that to that imagery and and that's where it's going into the new testament right we 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 can imagine now the connection with with the, with the davidic kingdom and the davidic kingdom and um the davidic covenant right <laughs> because christ is not only the promised seed of abraham he's the promised seed of david <laughs> But these are not mutually exclusive. So, so, so David's promise is really fulfilling. You see what I'm saying? Like it's really, it's really fulfilling. And so this is why there's a, there's a broader category that's going on behind here. And so if we don't understand the interconnectedness between the two of that precise relationship, there's so much confusion. So we have, so great. So we have blessing, great nation, great name. What else do we have? What else do we have? Verse seven, protection, land. Oh yeah, yeah, land. So we got land. What else? Offspring. Offspring. So that's in fifteen, right? Fifteen. We have offspring. Now, if you're reading, if you're reading in Genesis contextually, and we've already made the identification that the blessing is in response to the curse. Eve was expecting an offspring to undo the curse, right? Noah was even described as one do, uh, the one who would give us relief from the curse. So offspring in Genesis, what should we be thinking that this, this is? Singular or plural? Singular. Yeah, so fundamentally, Singular. it's it's offspring as in one, okay? And we're going to see that tonight. But there can also be uh, through faith, because right. So so clearly, there's also this there's this numberless people group as well. Offspring is like the is like the seashore, right? Sands of the seashore, the stars of heaven. So there is this fundamentally. 
one offspring that's going to undo, but there's also this, this body of, of numberless, numberless offspring that will also exist. And so then there is a relationship between these two. And so we're, we're going to get to that, that faith component. <laughs> My goodness. Anything, anything else in this blessing? Anything else in the blessing? Great reward. Yes. Yeah, so, so there's a great reward. So we could speak of great reward. So there's wealth, right? If you're tracking in Genesis, right? The, the king of Sodom tries to bless Abraham with possessions. And he says, no, I won't take it. I won't take your utang, right? Uh, I, I'm not going to have any debt to you, only to God, right? And so he refuses to take the wealth of Sodom, lest he says that he made, he made Abraham rich. Anything else in here? Anything else? And long, long, longevity of life. Yes, long life. Long life for sure. Excellent. I'll add two more that I found. There's uh, many nations. So it's not just one nation. And, and this, is, this is if you had time to do the rest of the passages, right? So there's many nations coming from uh, Abraham. And so, uh, again, that makes a lot of sense by faith, okay? He's the father of, of us all, <laughs> right? Protection, we, protection. Yes, no, there's okay, another one. Yeah, there's protection, right? Protection as well. Absolutely both physically now and eternally, right? And then, and then we, also have, we also have nations and we have uh, kings of nations. Anything else? I think this is, I think this is good. I, I don't know if there's any others like this. I think that this is, a good, this is a good framework, okay? There's a lot going on here, okay? And so people will try to slice and dice these. And, and we want to ask the question, is that Paul's intention is that Paul's intention in Galatians 3, okay? So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's, let's read the word of the Lord. Galatians 3, 13 to 18. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on the tree, so that... In Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. To give a human examples, my brothers, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds it to it once it is ratified. Now, the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to the many, but referring to the one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. The law does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. The law came 430 years afterward, that does not nullify anything that was given before that. If it does, it makes the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Wow. Okay, let's let's get into this here. Okay, let's get into this text here. Verse 13. Okay, verse 13. I do want to just highlight several things that are going on here to, to, to set up the context for us. Okay. So what we have going on here is the apostle Paul is writing the letter to the Galatians after the life, suffering, death, burial, resurrection, enthronement of the Lord Jesus. Paul is explaining the gospel, specifically what has occurred and been given through the person and work of Jesus Christ. Paul's primary focus is on the relationship between Jews and Gentiles and how the promise of Abraham is given through grace in Christ and not through the Old Testament law. And so I just I want to highlight one thing before we go into the text. 
the, the, the occasion of the, the setting of the writing. Okay, so Bruce, um, F.F. Bruce gives an excellent summary here. He says, the occasion of the letter was Paul's receiving news of people who had visited his Galatian mission field and were persuading his converts there to accept a different form of teaching from which he had given to them. He refers to these people as troublemakers and agitators. They were trying to impose on the Galatian Christians some of the requirements of the Jewish law, preeminently circumcision, okay? And so the whole point being is that if you want to be a, a partaker of the promises of Abraham, if you want to be a partaker of the Christ, if you want to be um, the, real, the real deal heir, right? You've got to do these Jewish law things, most importantly, circumcision. But there was also, you need to separate, right? They, they were still pronouncing Old Testament law upon these Gentiles. And so Paul says that this new teaching is denounced. It is a perversion of the true gospel of Christ. Galatian Christians who pay heed to it are warned that to submit to it is to turn away from God, to be severed from, from Christ and to fall from grace. So this is the context of what's going on. So P Paul in this passage here is going to be talking about what have we, so we learned last week, what, what we gained in Christ, the final Adam. Now we're going to learn tonight what we've gained in Abraham. <laughs> you see, so now not only what we've gained in Adam, now we're looking at what we gained in Abraham and what is our relationship to to Abraham and the and the, and the and the uh his the covenant given with him the promises given to him so fundamental for christology so fundamental for our for the gospel for our daily life okay um because even though we're not wrestling with jewish law <laughs> there's other traditions in our churches that are running around and people are putting them up like if you really want to be a christian if you are really a christian You've got to do these things. So Galatian and Christo are doing this. The Catholic Church are doing it. And even some of this is seeping into our Protestant churches. And so this is so practical for us this evening, for your members and for, for all of us here. Okay, so let's, I'm just going to work through this text. I'm going to, we're also going to be uh, looking at some other, other background uh, passages here. And also I, we are going to be using Step Bible. So I'm, I'm, I'm back on board with Step Bible. So we, I have my other program as well, but I do want us to, I want us to be start to be using Step Bible again, because this is, this is our go-to tool, very powerful. And um, I'll be using both. Okay. Um, okay. So let's go ahead and let's, let's start breaking down the text, ask a question, make an observation, or just, just listen along here. So the first thing I see here in verse 13 is this fundamental action of redeemed. So the action is redeemed. The one who does it, the actor, is none other than Christ. The one who are recipients of this are us. And so, of course, we can ask who. And then the separation or uh, the, the, the separation from which we've been redeemed from, we've been bought back from, is from the curse of the law. So this is the separation here, okay? And the means by which Christ has redeemed us, the specific means is here, by becoming a curse for us. So this is the means by which Christ redeems us. The, the question of who is the us, we can answer this. For sure, the us includes Paul because it's, it's a first person, but it's first person plural. And so this would include the, the audience, which are Galatian saints. And these, of course, are primarily Gentiles. But Paul is a Jew, as is Peter. So to, to really work through who the us is, we would say it's all saints, Jew and Gentile. Christ redeemed us 
from the curse by becoming a curse for us. This redeemed has, this is a, this is a counting language. We could say buying back language, right? So how does Christ buy us back? And the specific means is by becoming a curse for us. So then what does this imply? If, if, if Christ is, is, is um, becoming a curse for us, number one, this implies that, uh, number one, we are under a curse. A curse. What does curse signify? What does this signify? It's like a under penalty. God. Like yes. a penalty. Uh, what was that, Ray? Under God's wrath. Yeah, so penalty, wrath, and really we could also say the judgment has been meted out on us, right? So the way, the way by which Christ redeems us is by becoming our curse, okay? And so clearly here, this, this, this has imputation language, right? This has imputation language here, negatively. Right. And so clearly, then what's going on here is this substitutionary idea. So, this is why we talk about substitutionary atonement. Everyone's tracking there with me. So, Christ redeems us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The, the, the state here of being the curse for us. Uh, is really profound because the thing is, it unlike other other religion, it covers everything that is being needed to be accomplished or the requirement of which to yeah. be. Like Muslims do, do not believe in substitutionary uh, redemption. Yeah, the Catholic is just half half. Yeah, partly and partly works. A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. Say something. What is profound there is it is difficult to easily understand. We cannot easily understand this unless really we, re, we really dig deeper and study deeper on this one. That's why now I understand why so many people do not easily believe, why people just keep on arguing, keep yeah. on um, making excuses because it's hard. It's really hard. It's really hard to accept once. At the same time, we have the, the way our orientation is really on working, even in our whatever jobs we have or whatever endeavor we do, it's always working toward, leaning towards accomplishing something for you to have it. Something it's like all good works because we, we, have been, we have been indoctrinated with yeah. do good works, do good things, you're good. Yeah, exactly. And, it, and it's... And it's very much merit based, right? It's almost like merit based, and that's and that's and that's not what's going on here. Um, excellent, excellent uh, reflections here. Let's take a step back now and let's look at the broader context here. Let's look at the broader context of Galatians three, um, because now there's a positive aspect. This is focusing on the negative aspect. Uh, let's go to the positive aspect now. Okay, so it says uh, verse verse six. Um, uh, even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So even though in verse 13, the focus is upon the negative, that he, that he is um, our curse, right? That's the negative component of the law. There is now this positive component, righteousness. So let's do a quick search here. Let's just... Um, Click on this here. And so this word analysis here, righteousness can be fair, equitable, dealing with justice. Um, it can deal with uh, justification. Look at this meaning here. Righteousness, what is right, justice, the act of doing. So then this is the focus here. In this context, righteousness is the act of doing what is in agreement with, with God's standards. So it's being in this state. So look at this. The state of being in proper relationship to God, in agreement with God's standards, okay? So then coming over to here, there is this uh, positive 
need for for Christ's righteousness to be given to us. And that's what Paul says in the text, Christ's righteousness. Right? And that's coming from verse, from verse 6. And so remember, the fundamental aspect of the law is two, right? Love, God, love, others. So, of course, we can talk about not killing someone as negative, prohibition, right? You know, but then the law requires positive and fundamentally it's love God and love others, right? And so this is where, this is where it's so much more than just, oh, a negative removal of guilt, right? So, so the Catholic church will say it's, it's, it's a removal of our guilt. Yes, but you still have to do, right? But, but Paul is clearly saying here, our faith is credited to us for righteousness. Coming down here very briefly, for as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, cursed is everyone who does not do, who does not abide by all the things written in the book of the law to perform them. And so really here we have that explicit statement, that explicit statement that we have to do all perfectly. And only Christ does it. And so coming here, of course, our focus is on the curse component. That's where we're at in verse 13. But really understanding that there is clearly, strongly, this imputation both negatively and positively. Our guilt is imputed to Christ. Christ's righteousness is imputed to us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And so my question is, how does how does this relate so we're looking at this right here how, how does how does this relate what is the word that gives us the relationship and what is the relationship okay so first give to me what the we can so what the question i'm asking here is i'm asking you should be answering from this column here <laughs> what is that relationship when, when we ask relationship we're always looking for connect conjunctions or conjunction type words so if we look at this word for what do you think that's going to be giving for us I'm sorry. I, I, I'm, an I explanation. Yes, I'm. I'm. I, I apologize. I apologize. So, so yeah, for sure, it could be explanation. Okay, for sure, it could be explanation. This is my. This is my mistake here. We can also look in this section here because I believe it's actually dependent here. So, looking here, as so, explanation is very close. So, this could be an idea. Explanation. So, Henry is correct. But then, if it's dependent, it could also be here, which and then in which case it would be a a cause or a or a basis. Do I have basis here? I've got to add basis. Let me add basis. This is a work in progress. So I do apologize um, if it's not there. So let me, <laughs> let me highlight this here. I'm sorry. Here we go. Basis. So, I mean, really uh, explanation or basis, it's, it's, it's very similar. It's the explanation, or we could say basis, or we could say, again, now we're just functionally, it's the foundation. What's the basis for Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. What's the, what's the explanation for this? What's the foundation? Okay. Uh, and the foundation comes in God's Old Testament writing. It, it is written or has been written. And then we have an OT citation here. Okay. So let's look here at the basis. All right. So um, verse 13, verse 13, redeemed us from the curse, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And so we can see here. So, so looking here, step Bible gives us that connection. So I'm just going to click on this here. Deuteronomy 21, 23, his corpse shall not hang all night on a tree, but you shall surely bury him on the same day. For he who is hanged on a tree is accursed of God. Christ is literally fulfilling the commands even in his death. Does everyone see that? Even in his death, Christ is fulfilling the law in order to save us. So this is coming from Deuteronomy 21:23. And so he is and so this is this is a proof that Christ is in fact fulfilling so, so everyone sees this. So remember how they wagged their tongues at him and said, if you're the son of God, come down off the cross. 
in order for him to feel to fulfill scripture to be the son of god he can't come off the cross so powerful so christ in his death is literally fulfilling the requirement the other thing i want to say here i'm going to we're going to think about the law here so let's let's come out here and let's think about the law the law is referring to the mosaic law Looking at the big picture from Hebrews and elsewhere, God's eternal law is in heaven. It's coming down in a shadow and it's coming into the present in the, the law of Christ. But, but these are not different laws. This is just a, a, a visible manifestation. So Romans 2, 14 to 15 says that both, both uh, Jew and Gentile are under this law, even though the Gentiles don't have it because the law is written on their hearts, okay? And so we, we can't think of this law as, so there's a whole position in, in academia now just to say, no, the law is just the Mosaic law. It's just aspects of the law it's not eternal this is not eternal justification they're 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 rejecting um they're rejecting the etern the, the you know the, the mosaic law is done away with and there's there's a truth uh that's such a partial truth it's not the full truth so we can we the law is god's manifestation in concrete form of his eternal code in the heavenly places, okay? And so, of course, it's in a specific context. So a lot of those things are done away with because it's a different context. But fundamentally, if we understand the law as, as love, love God and others, this has always been in effect, right? It's always been in effect. It's just a specific context that's never changed from, from, from garden to new Jerusalem. It's always been the same love God with all your heart, mind, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the summary of the law. And so we can, so even for us, we can use the mosaic law to preach the gospel, right? Jesus did it. We can do it. So this is why, so I'm going to, I'm going to step on a little bit of toes here. There's a movement now to really reject the Mosaic law is being abrogated and, and done away with. And as a covenantal system, that's correct. But as, as the law with its eternal components, absolutely not. It's forever there. And, and we have that visible form in the Old Testament. So we can directly command, you shall not murder. That includes hate. And if you do, you're breaking God's law and you're going to be judged. And so if we talk about that being abrogated and done away with, how can we preach the gospel? How can we hold people accountable? So this is so important and so fundamental. And there's so much confusion on this. Yeah, I, I like what you said earlier, Tim, that the moment that we abrogate the law, there is really no other way of measuring man's uh, e evilness or <laughs> sinfulness. <laughs> because that the law, the moral law, speaks volume about the character of yeah. man. It, it, simple, yeah. simple, simple logic details that there is no law because if there is no law, there is no crime, no no sin. That's the saying. Let's abrogate the law so all of us will have, uh, will have no sin. That's true. You're suppressing the truth. Right. Yeah, diba? as Paul would put it in Romans, the suppressing of the truth. Yeah, 100%. Excellent. Excellent. Now look at this. Look at the blessing. Look at this. This is so powerful here. Watch this, okay? We have here now. So the big idea here is that um, Christ redeemed us from the curse by becoming the curse, and that includes both his 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 taking the curse upon us, and then also giving us his righteousness, and that's written in the Old Testament, the old the the, the old the Old Testament law. And here's the other big takeaway: there's no other way that we can be, but with the with the coming of Christ. The only way that we could be in a relationship with Christ is through the old, old covenant up until the coming of Christ. Is everyone tracking there with me? So there's no other way. There's no other way to be in a right relationship with God. And now that Christ is here, again, the only relationship is through Christ. And so people really want to 
talk down the Mosaic law and, and poo poo it. And that, and that, that's also from Satan. That is also from Satan because that's not the full picture. That's not the full picture. Okay. Let's move on here. So then now what's the relationship from here to here? What's this relationship here? How about this conjunction here and here? So now we're looking at, we're looking at these modifications here. What type of relationship would that give us? Very close. So what about purpose? Because it's pointing forward the purpose. The pr so this is a purpose here. So why, why did Christ redeem us from the curse of the law? What was the purpose for him redeeming, for becoming a curse for us? And that purpose is so that in Christ, in Christ, look at this, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. Does everyone see that? That's the purpose. And look at this. So the blessing has to come to the Gentiles. And look at this here. We might receive. So again, this comes back to Jew and Gentile, and we're receiving it. We're the objects. We might receive the promised spirit through faith. This is an object here. This is the, the blessing of Abraham. And this is the, the promised spirit through faith. There's what Henry's talking about, the means. Is everyone tracking with what I'm saying? Is that making sense? The blessing of Abraham and the promised spirit. D did anyone see a blessing of the promised spirit in, in, in your study in Genesis? Did anyone see that? Did we, did we make that list over here? <gasps> no, the answer should be no. The, the promised spirit is, is promised through the new covenant, right? So, so let's, let's look up this cross reference here. Let's look up this cross reference. So look at uh, Acts 2.33. Acts 2.33. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of the Father and having received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he, he has poured forth which you both see and hear. Okay? And so in Acts 2.33, though, that's quotation from Joel. So let's go to Joel, Joel 2.28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. And all, even the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And so this is the, the giving of the spirit in the new covenant. And so we could see it in Joel 2, 28. But notice how the new covenant is connected with the blessing <laughs> The blessing of, of, of Abraham. Do you see that? So all the all the blessings and all the promises in the new covenant, it, it's it's not, they're, they're all interconnected. Do you see that? The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that we might receive the promised spirit. And that promised spirit was prophesied in, in Joel 2:28. It was also prophesied in other passages of scripture. Let me let me write down several more for you. We also have in Isaiah, Isaiah 32, 15, Isaiah 43, Isaiah 43, 15. And so what we're seeing here is that Jew and Gentile were all partakers of, of, the, of the blessing of Abraham. There's no distinction here, okay? And so some people will say all that's being referenced here is just the gospel, you know, and, and also the promised spirit and nothing else. Okay. So some commentators will say that, but the question is, is it just that, or is it much more? And I'm going to, I'm going to pique your interest here. And then we're going to look at the text coming down here. We have this word inheritance. And so what I want to submit to you is that inheritance is the fundamental idea of what we get in Abraham. Okay, this is fundamental. So it's much more than just the promised spirit. It's much more than just a blessing that all the nation, all the Gentiles will be blessed. So let's think about that inheritance term. So it's much more. And if, if you're an heir of Abraham, you're going to get the whole thing. <laughs> you're going to get everything. All right. Okay. So 
Now Paul is going to uh, Paul is going to transition to give us in verse fifteen. What is the relationship from here to here? And so coming back to my hand, our handy dandy outline, we should have it here illustration. <laughs> oh my goodness, we're getting it. Okay, so this should be this should be an idea illustration. Okay, so if everyone can see this. This is why we're working on the outline in live. You're seeing it in live in live time here, okay? Illustration. So what's being given here is an illustration, okay? And Paul literally says that here, right? To give a, a human example, it's an illustration, okay? So what he's going to argue from is from, this argument is from, analogy or illustration, or we could even say, I, I'm becoming stronger on this idea, is uh, lesser to greater, okay? If, if the human example is real, how much more the, the divine example, okay? So right now we're dealing, with, we're dealing with human example. How much more, how much more the divine? Everyone's tracking there. So if, if this human example works, it makes sense. How much more God's divine example, okay? And so look at this here now. The example is, uh, the specific example is even with a man-made covenant, okay? So this is the specific, this is, ex the ex I don't know if we want to use condition, but this would be the specific comparison. So we could say probably comparison, Look at this. Even with the man-made covenant, no one annuls or adds to it once it's ratified, right? There's no annulling or adding once it's ratified, correct? Everyone tracking there? So whether it's a deed of sale, whether it's a, a last will or testament, whether it's a contract, right? It could be a contract between two parties. Whatever it is, okay? Um, there's massive debate. There's dissertations written on what Paul's referring to here. If we're thinking of covenant, let's just think of in, in simple terms, this could be here agreement. Boy, boy, do you want to add anything to this? So even with a man-made agreement or contract, no one annuls or adds to it once it's ratified, okay? Because remember, the issue is, is that the Jews, the 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 agitators were saying, hey, you want to be, you want to be, you want to be in the promises of Abraham? You want to receive Christ? You got to take circumcision. You've got to do the dietary laws, baby. Come on. You want the promises of Abraham? You've got to do the law. And so what Paul is going to do is he's, he's separating the two and saying, no, the promises of Abraham are not locked into the law. Yes, we're going to see later in Galatians, if you study it, there is a purpose for why the law was there, why it was put in place. But fundamentally, the two are not inseparable. The, the Jews, the Jewish agitators were saying they're inseparable. You want the promises of Christ? You've got to do blah, 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 blah. Okay? And, and Paul's saying, no, 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 no. Even in human example, once that thing's locked down, once that promise is made, baby, no one adds or, 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 or cancels it. It's, it's, it's sealed. So look at this. That's the illustration. He's going to apply it to the Abrahamic covenant. Okay? So this is now the divine, the divine promise, the divine covenant. If human covenants work this way, how much more divine? Look at what he says here. Now it does not say and to offsprings referring to the many, but referring to the one and to your offspring. So it does not say this referring to many, but referring to one. But referring to one. And that's in the context, the promise to Eve, one, one offspring will undo the curse. Who is your offspring? Who is the Christ? Everyone tracking there with me? 
So the promise of God to Abraham in Genesis, it is the eternal kingdom. Yes, we're going to get there. We're going to get there, okay? But yes, it's moving in that 100%. It's, it's the whole earth and it's the eternal kingdom. Yes. And we're going to prove that. We're going to prove that very soon. So this statement here, uh, the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. So this, the, the quotation here, it does not say into seeds referring to the many, but rather to, to your seed. That is the Christ. So let's, so let's go to this Old Testament reference here and let's, and, and let's, and let's uh, unpack it. So uh, Genesis 15, the quotation is really here. So shall your offspring be the cross reference for offspring includes if you want to write this down Galatians 3 8 Genesis 12 3 Genesis uh 3 uh 12 7 13 15 16 15 5 Genesis uh 12 3 I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you will curse and in and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed and so in you is referring to the Messiah the Christ. Okay. So that's one example. All right. Um, continue on here. 15, five, 15, five, he brought him outside and said, look toward the heaven and the numbers of the stars. If you're able to number them, then he said to them, so shall your offspring be now notice here. This is, if you, if you click on it below, it's singular. And so of course there's an implication to the universality of the offspring. So um, there is that sense, but we're not, Paul is not denying that there is going to be limitless offspring because we are part of it, but fundamentally is there that individual component? So here you can see individual and corporate because of union with Christ. Okay. And so people will use this text to say, see, Paul is taken out of context. And I would say no, because in the original context, there's both that individual and corporate in the original context, though, there would be more of a corporate accent here but both are present. Okay. But then if we go to, to, to Genesis 17, seven, I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. Again, um, this is, th there's a singular and corporate, but it's the focus is on Christ. Okay. As an everlasting covenant. Okay. So again, Looking at the whole, the canonical context, the original context in, in Genesis 3, you, we have to see the offspring fundamentally as one and then being granted by faith. A, a failure to see that, um, because notice how Esau does not get the blessing. The covenant is not established with Esau. Uh, Ishmael does not get the blessing. Do you see what I'm saying? And so a parallel passage to, 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 to discuss this individual corporate context is also Romans 9 and 10, uh, Galatians 4. So let's just write, let's just write those passages down. So we can look at um, here, we can look at Romans 4, also Romans 9 to 11, uh, Genesis 12, 15. 17, et cetera. And, and I can share those references later in the handout. And so, and so what Paul is saying here is that, is that not that all of the, so here's, let me be clear, not that all of, because there's that corporate component. So there's more than one that's going to receive the blessing, but the one through whom everyone receives the blessing is the one is the Christ. Is everyone tracking there with me? Is that making sense? But you can see without, with a superficial reading, this would seem to, to, to suggest, I'm sorry, going back to um, Genesis, you could say, oh, you know, there could have been a wrong interpretation where it's just looking at it corp from a corporate perspective and an ethnic perspective, an ethnic Jew, regardless of faith, correct? You could see that. That's a bad translation. Of, that's a bad interpretation, but you can see how, you can see how that's brought in, okay? And this is why, looking at the whole of scripture and looking at Paul's ex, the revelation that was given to Paul keeps everything perfect and, and correct. And, 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 and we don't diverge into, into, into wrong truth. Okay. So look at what Paul says here. This is what I mean. So let's bring this back up here. This is what I mean. 
so this is so then this is the 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 Abrahamic covenant, and then all of these are going to be are going to be explained. Okay, so this is an explanation. This is what Paul means. Okay, so we have we could have a a statement, a declaration here. If I'm preaching this bad boy, there's a declaration, main truth. Christ redeemed us so that you will receive the promises of, a- of, of Abraham, okay? Main point, illustration. Even in hum- human examples, right? That covenant has been made with, with whoever physically, it's locked in, okay? In, in the Abrahamic covenant, it was locked in and referring to only to one, to, to the Christ, not to all of the people. So just because you have ethnic connection to Abraham doesn't mean you're getting his promise, okay? And so then Paul is going to get this really clear. What does, what, this is what I mean. The law does not, the the law does not annul, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. This came, this law came. This is the description. The law came 430 years later, because if that's the case, if it's through law, then look at this. If it's through law, then the result is this. The result. If, if, if we say positively, if, it, if, if the law does annul the covenant, then it makes the promise void. You can't have it both ways. If you want the promise of God, then the law doesn't abolish it. If you're saying, no, it's all through the law, then you abolish the promise of God. But the critical thing here is it does not, it does not annul a covenant. Here's the final explanation. This is the explanation, or we could say, yeah, this is the explanation here. If the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham means by a promise. This is a true conditional statement. This is a true conditional statement. But look at this. But God didn't, God didn't give it through law, baby. <laughs> He gave it by a promise. And so the last thing that we're going to close on here is what is this inheritance? Is it just, is it just the gospel in some, you know, willy-nilly sense, non-literal sense? Is it just the promise of the spirit? What is this inheritance here? What is the inheritance? So we're going to answer the question, what is the inheritance? What is this inheritance here? So let's first answer what Paul says. So if I come down here to the end of Galatians 3, 29, look at this. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor for all of you are sons of God. So look at this. More than, more than sons of Abraham, you are sons of Abraham. We're sons of God. We're sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave or free man. There is neither male or female for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ Jesus, then you are Abraham's descendants. Heirs according to the promise. So look, let's write this bad boy down here, okay? Number one, sons of God. So this goes back to Eve. This goes back to Eve, Eve's offspring, right? Right? True offspring, spiritual offspring. Two, sons of Abraham. Number three, Christ's. This is Messiah. Four, What else do we have here? Heirs. Heirs. 
right? So imagine this. God gives a whole bunch of promises to Abraham. All of his offspring gets it, right? So Christ gets it. And then all by faith. If you're Christ, you get the promises of Abraham. Heirs according to the promise. So important. Now we're going to end on this. And this is, this is Henry's question. We're almost, I appreciate you guys staying. We, we're, we're late here. Um, here we go. I'm going to go to several passages and we'll be done here. Tim, before, before you end, I, 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 will, I will make uh, one observation regarding your question, Kanina, which I was not able to catch up. When, when, when Paul was making that uh, example of a man-made uh, contract, yeah. uh, it's like comparing a law that is passed by Congress. A law passed by Congress cannot annul the constitution of the land. Whether it is American, Filipino, that's it. Yeah, no, really yeah. good. You cannot annul it. You cannot annul it. Really you cannot, because the constitution is higher than the law passed by Congress. Just like this. Ah. The, the, the covenant of God is higher than the, the law of man. That's 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 yeah. that's what uh, uh, Paul is trying to explain here. So I don't know if uh, no. the, you guys was able to get it. That's the comparison. No, that that is that is excellent. So the illustration could be Constitution either in the Philippines or in the U.S. And then this is the Constitution, and then this is new laws. This cannot change. It's not possible. You have to amend the constitution. Now it's one step up because what Paul is saying is that it cannot be amended. <laughs> so no, this is a great illustration, but this is like, this is like a constitution that has been sealed. And, and may, maybe the, the last will and testament is the best example, right? Because once the will all you can do is interpret the will. You cannot change the will once the person dies. So, so, so another illustration could be, and some commentators were talking about this will or testament. Once the person dies, you, you, can, you can have legal scholars look at the, what the content says, but you cannot change the, you can't change the benefactors. It's impossible. 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 Come on. Yeah. All right, here we go. So, um, heirs a promise. So let's go, uh, Romans 415. Here we go. Uh, let's go to, yeah, look at this for the promise of Abraham. So just in Galatians three, the promise of Abraham, right? The same, the same statement, the promise of Abraham and of his offspring that he would be heir of the world. <laughs> Come on, man. That. That's everything. The heir of the world did not come through law, but through the righteousness of faith. So this is beyond, this is the land. This is the entire earth. Okay. This is new heavens, new earth. It's, it's the whole shebang. One example. Okay. So, so to define this Romans, Romans 4, 13 to 15. Second passage here. Hebrews 11, 8. Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abraham obeyed. He, he was called to go to a place where he was to receive an inheritance, right? The same promise, Jacob, Isaac, they lived in tents. Look at this. They were looking forward to a city that has a foundation, has foundations whose designer and builder is God. So here we have the earth. In, in Hebrews 11, 8 to 18, we have God's city. God's city. So we have the earth. We have God's city. By faith, Sarah received power to conceive. We're born descendants many uh, beyond the stars of the heavens. These all died in faith, not having re received the things promised. So even though they, they never received it in actuality, but seen, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they are strangers and exiles on the earth for people who speak this way, make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. They're thinking of a land. Um, if they had been thinking about the land by which they had gone out, they would have an opportunity to return. 
But as it is, they desire a better country, a heavenly one. He has prepared for them a city. So this is a, a heavenly country. Heir of promise. And then here's the last passage for us. Henry said eternal kingdom. Henry read my notes. A hundred percent. He read my notes. Henry gets the gold star for tonight. If I had a bell, I'd, I'd ring it. Hebrews 12, 28. Therefore, let us be grateful to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. He's going to shake the earth up here, right? At, his voice shook once more. He's going to shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Once more, he will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This, this indicates the removal of all things in order that the things that cannot be shaken remain. Therefore, let us be grateful to receive a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Hebrews 12, 28, the eternal kingdom. So I want to close on this. No doubt it's debated and no doubt people will, will say this or that. The Abrahamic covenant is another, a, a, a visible manifestation of the covenant of grace in which God gives, he selected a people and he's given us all things. He's made us his sons. We're sons of Abraham, but more importantly, we're sons of God. That's further revealed in the Davidic covenant. Both of those covenants are eternal. They're visible manifestations of the covenant of grace. The Mosaic covenant was temporary, a temporary administration pointing towards the new covenant. And the new covenant is just another way of describing, again, this covenant of grace. It begins, it begins in time and space with the promise to Eve. And it ends in the eternal kingdom. And all of these things are moving towards it. And a fundamental idea is that of inheritance. What do we inherit? God is the Lord, the king of the universe, and he's going to give us all things in Christ. And so we give him glory and honor. So in Christology tonight, Christ is the final Adam. He is, he is the heir of the Abrahamic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant promises and and by faith we are heirs with him this is the fourth truth of christology